Lord was on verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. Amen. It's getting better, though. Thank you. Father God, we come before you right now. We ask your blessing to be upon the reading of your holy word. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. All right, Genesis chapter 1, we learn how important it is to begin with God in our lives. Amen. It's important that we have the Lord in our lives. We come to Genesis chapter 2, and the Bible tells us the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. And then verse 2, and on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Go to the book of Hebrews in the fourth chapter. And the book of Hebrews is the interpretation on the rest of God. Amen. Amen. Brother's getting better all the time. I can actually hear now. All right, Hebrews chapter 4. You're there, say praise the Lord. Let me brought your Bible with you. Amen. Hebrews 4 1. Let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into the rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. Okay, so in chapter 2, we see God's care for man. God's care for man. The first thing we see is that there is a rest for the people of God. A rest. It's called the Sabbath. So if you'll look at it in verse 2 again. On the seventh day God ended His work which He had made. He rested on the seventh day from all His work which He had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it He had rested from all His work which God created and made. So we saw God created the heavens and the earth the original earth and then we see it was in a chaotic state and God the presence of God began to move over that chaotic earth and begin to perfect it and to complete it so that man would have a place uh, to dwell upon this earth in the completion and perfections of God now we come after that completion process to the seventh day which is the Sabbath or the rest so I want you to notice something this takes place before the fall of man. Genesis 3 is the fall of man. So the rest of God we see in the seventh day is before the fall of man. So God's intention for man after he created man, put him in the garden, was that he would enter into the rest of God, the Sabbath. So before the fall, that's the way it was. He woke up and he was in the rest of God. Now, the seventh day is the day that God sanctified it to Himself. And it speaks of physical rest, but there's something that's more important than physical rest, and that is spiritual rest Amen. or redemption. Now you can have physical rest, you can sleep and get physical rest, but if you don't have redemption or salvation rest or spiritual rest, the physical rest is not that important. So the most important thing for us is that we have spiritual rest or redemptive rest in God. And that's what the book of Hebrews is talking about in the fourth chapter. The importance of entering into the rest of God is not necessarily talking about physical rest, a Sabbath day where you get physical rest. It's talking about a spiritual rest that you find in salvation. How many of y'all understand that? Okay. Now, when you talk about the seventh day, you need to understand some very important things. First of all, as you go through the Scripture, there are different days, lengths of time. 
In Genesis, when we see the Bible uh, in the first chapter, it talks about these various days. Amen. The first, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, sixth day, so on and so forth. It says, in the evening and the morning were, whether it be the first day, second day, on down through there. Do you see that? Okay. When you have a marker, a number, or a phrase like the evening and the morning, that is always talking about a solar day or 24 hours. All right? But the Bible talks about other days that are not 24 hours, that are not, not marked out by a particular number or a particular phrase, and it is a period of time. You understand that? Okay? So in the Scripture, the Bible talks about thousand-year days. One day with the Lord is as a thousand years. So there is a solar day, 24-hour days, that are marked by a number or a phrase, and then you have thousand-year days, which is known as a dispensational day. Okay, you with me? Do you understand that? Yeah. Now, as we look at these days right here, the first six days of creation have markers of time, the evening and the morning, so on and so forth. So these are literal 24-hour days. But they are symbolic of thousand-year days. So you have a total of seven days here when you come to the day of rest, symbolically representing 7,000 years of God working in man's redemption. Okay? So even though in the creative week, these days are literal 24-hour days. They are not long periods of time or long ages. Because it says, in the evening and the morning were, the evening and the morning were, so on and so forth. Do you understand that? Okay. So they're not long periods of time or long ages, these uh, days that we see in the creative week. But they are symbolic of thousand-year days of man's redemption. Now, what year is it right now from Adam? What year is it right now? 2000 what? 14. Where do we get that time? 2014. Good. Okay, so 4,000 years. 4,000 years from Adam, sixth day. 4,000 years from Adam to Jesus Christ, approximately. Correct? Then after Jesus Christ, we have 2014 years. Correct? So what year is it, basically, from Adam? 6,014. 6,014 years. Y'all with me so far? So what that tells me is that we're very close to the beginning of the seventh millennium, which is the day of the Lord. So you have six, approximately 6,000 years, each one of these literal 24-hour days, Symbolic of 7,000 years in the redemption of man. 6,000 years for man. It's called man's day. And then the 7,000th year is the day of the Lord or the seventh day. Do you understand that? Okay. So we are almost at the completion of man's 6,000 years. And we are about to enter into the day of the Lord when the Lord comes back and sets up His earthly kingdom. So those 24-hour days on the creative week of Genesis chapter 1 are symbolic of 7,000 years of man's day. How many of y'all understand that? The third thing that you need to understand is that these phrases and terms here in the Scripture, we talk about days, are also symbolic of dimensions. So you have 24-hour days, you have 1,000-year days, you have... Uh, the creative week here, uh, 24 hour little days, and then 7,000 years of man's history, but that is also symbolic of dimensions, and that's very important for you to understand. It is symbolic of dimensions. Is everybody with me here? Okay. Now, God wants us to have rest. Now, when you talk about the seventh day, it's the day the Lord sanctified unto Himself and he rested from all that he had made over here in the creative week. Do you see that? Say, God rested from all that he had made. But, again, that seventh day is a picture of the seventh millennium when Jesus will come back and set up his earthly kingdom. 
Anybody with me here? Okay. And at that point, we enter into the ultimate rest of God when He's ruling and reigning upon the earth. So we're real close to that time frame. We're basically right in here somewhere, right before the beginning of the seven-year tribulation period. And after that seven-year tribulation period, because we're right here, this is the church age. Do you see that? This is the church age. That's where we are. Right here, the seven-year tribulation period will come upon the earth. And after that, the Lord will return and set up His earthly kingdom in the seventh millennium. So we're very close to the beginning of the seventh millennium, which is the rest of God upon the earth. Does everybody understand that? Now, because this is symbolic of dimensions, it speaks of the rest that we receive in the Spirit. So let's go back to the book of Hebrews. See, we don't have to wait for the seventh day to come or the seventh millennium to come to enter into the rest of God. Do you understand that? When you and I became born again believers, we experienced the rest of God inside of us. Alright? And we are able to, right now, we are able to enter into the rest of God which this seventh millennium is a, a picture of. Okay, do you understand that? We don't have to wait to get to the second coming of Jesus to enter into that rest. So let's go to Hebrews 4 again. And the Bible is very, very uh, explicit on this understanding in verse 1. It says, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into His rest any of you should seem to come short of it. Okay? So God is talking to us here and He's telling us there's something that we need to labor to enter into. Now notice, our labor has not stopped. But So what is the labor? The labor is entering into that rest of God. So we have to labor to enter into that rest. So there's a labor. Now, where, where have we ceased laboring? Okay? Do you understand? We're in rest, right? In the Spirit, in rest. But, okay, the Bible says we're laboring to enter into that rest. If, I'm la if I enter into that rest, am I laboring anymore? Okay. Well, what it's doing, what it's teaching you is that you're no longer doing your own stuff. Okay? You've entered into His rest. Now, let's just keep reading so you'll understand. Let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into His rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as He said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. So the Bible tells us that right now, if you're a born-again believer, you have entered into the rest of God. You don't have to wait for that seventh millennium. Okay? So Adam was created, and Eve, on the sixth day. They woke up, and as soon as they woke up, they woke up in the rest of God. And all they had to do was go out into the garden and keep it and till it, so on and so forth. It was not harsh. It was not hard labor. It was just a part of just going out there and, and reaping what God had done. All right, you understand? So he entered into the rest. But at the fall, man lost that rest. So what God did is he had a plan to come and restore man back to his rest. Okay? You understand that? This will happen upon the earth, but right now in the Spirit, as we're born again in the church, we are experiencing the rest of God right now. So He's restoring back to us what was lost in the Garden of Eden in the fall. Does everybody understand that somewhat? If you do, lift your hand. Okay. Now, as we look at it then, we need to understand something. The first 4,000 years... What was going on before Jesus came into the world? Man was laboring. He was, it was by himself. He was laboring, okay? 
Now watch this. The fifth day and the sixth day is the church age. We're right at the end of 2,000 years of the church. So the fifth day and the sixth day is the church age. Now, the first 4,000 is man doing it all by himself. It's man laboring. When you get to the church age, Jesus labored. He came and He labored. He died on the cross. When He labored, He took a bride. Alright? That's the church. He took a bride. And now, in the church age, because Jesus labored and He took a bride, we are laborers together with Christ. Do you understand that? So the first 4,000 years, man laboring. Jesus comes, He labors. He takes a bride. We are laborers together with Christ. The seventh millennium, okay, you with me? When you get to the seventh millennium, this is when God does it all by Himself. It's no longer us laboring, you know, understand what I'm saying? Okay, back again. 4,000 years before Christ came, man laboring. These two days, Jesus comes and labors, takes a bride. We are labors together with Him. But notice, the church is not the end of all things. There is a kingdom right here. It's the seventh millennium when we have the rest of God upon the earth. Does everybody understand that? Alright? So even though we're in the church age and we're laboring together with Christ, we can move into the spirit dimension of the seventh millennium, the kingdom age type operation of God, where we have the manifestation of God, the glory of God being seen upon a people. And it's God doing it all by Himself. Does that make sense? Okay, so man laboring for 4,000 years. Jesus comes and labors, takes a bride. We're labors together with Him in the church. And then now in the Spirit, we can actually move into this dimension, the seventh dimension, and entering into the rest of God as far as a kingdom type Operation Is everybody with me? Do you understand that? This is when Jesus does it all by Himself. Now, alright, I'm just, I'm gonna do my best. Okay, I'm gonna teach you advanced things, but you gotta think. You gotta really think about what I'm saying, alright? Now, in the tabernacle, what we have here is a type and shadow of things. Okay? You have an outer enclosure. You have a tabernacle. You've got a holy place and a holy of holies. Do you see that? Okay, how many pieces of furniture are associated with the tabernacle? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so the tabernacle, when you lay it out over time, what you see is this. You with me here? The outer enclosure, first 4,000 years before Christ, man laboring, it's all brass. Okay? Then you come to the holy place. The holy place in the tabernacle, right here, that's where you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You're water baptized in Jesus' name in the outer enclosure. You come into the holy place. You receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost in the holy place. The holy place is the church age. You see that? Okay? In the church, you have wood overlaid with gold, and you have this menorah here that's beaten out of solid gold. Do you see that? Okay. So what we have is in the outer enclosure you have man laboring, the brass. When you go into the holy place, we are laborers together with God. That's why you have gold overlaying the wood. Does that make sense to you? That's the church age. When you go beyond the veil, okay, you got this ark right here with the tables of the law in it. And on top of that ark is a solid piece of gold that weighed 700 pounds. There is no wood in the mercy seat at all. It's solid gold. Gold speaks of deity. So this is God all by Himself. So I'm, I'm just, I'm laying one thing upon another. When you look in the book of Genesis, all fives lay on all fives throughout the Bible. We have the seedbed of understanding in Genesis. All fives lay on, on fives throughout the Scripture. All threes, all sevens. Do you understand what I'm saying here? Okay. 
So I'm just giving you another picture here. So again, the outer enclosure is man laboring, first 4,000 years. The holy place is the church age, 2,000 years. We are labors together with Christ. Notice, the priest goes into the holy place. He's got to work with the anointing oil. He has to uh, apply the, uh, he has to work with the table of showbread. He has to put the bread on the table. Do you understand what I'm saying here? He has to take the incense. He has to offer the incense on this altar right here. So we see man laboring with God. Okay? When you get beyond the veil in the seventh dimension, when you get it, this represents his throne, his kingdom, his rest. When you get in this dimension right here and you have a solid piece of gold called the mercy seat, this is God all by Himself. Okay, do you understand where I'm going here? So in the church, you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you receive the rest of God inside of you, you are labors together with God, but when you go beyond the veil and you get into the Holy of Holies or the seventh dimension here where God does it all by Himself, what you are doing is you are seeing what God has already done and you are entering into that dimension, what God has already done. All right? You understand? So that, that's the difference. In the church age, we're labors together with God. Whenever you move dimensionally into the seventh dimension, what is happening is you just find out what God has already done and you enter into that. Okay? Praise the Lord. So there's a labor. Now I have the Spirit of God in me. I have the rest of God in me right now. But this is an ultimate thing. It's a seventh dimension thing. It's the rest of God. That's what we're going for right here. That, and we can enter into that rest right now. Okay? Where God does it all by Himself. Does everybody understand that? If you do, say praise the Lord. Alright, somewhat. Now, when we get to the New Testament, You'll notice something. Because it's been 4,000 years of man's day. So when you get to the day when Jesus comes, the fifth day, at the end of 4,000 years, the beginning of the fifth day and the sixth day, you got one, two days in the church age, and the third day is His kingdom. Does everybody understand that? So as far as the church is concerned, you have one, two, three days. So the third dimension then in the, the age of grace is the same thing as the seventh. Does everybody understand that? Okay. Well, so what we have here, the Bible says that the light is shining out of Mount Zion. Uh, so what's happened is these are shadows. Like the tabernacle of the Old Testament is a shadow. So what is a shadow? How is it created? How is it made? Is it, what is light? Is light a shadow? No, in order to have a shadow, you have to have an object standing in the light. Okay, you with me? So, in Mount Zion, you have the light where everything is finished, everything is perfect. So the light is shining from Mount Zion on the cross. And as that light's shining on the cross, it casts a shadow Back into the Old Testament, this tabernacle is a type and shadow of that which is to come. Okay? So the light is shining from eternity, right, Mount Zion? It hits this object. That object is the cross. That cross creates the types and the shadows that we find in the Old Testament. When you get in the New Testament, notice what's happened. Okay, the light's shining this way. It hits the cross. When it hits the cross, it lays the shadow of the Old Testament. Does everybody understand that? Now, okay, the light's hitting the cross, correct? Alright, what happens when the sun gets higher and higher and the light gets higher and higher? What happens when it gets on the other side? Okay? If you look at it from this point of view, we have the cross here and the light is shining out of Zion. It hits the cross, casts its shadow back in the Old Testament. All right, But as the shadow passes through the object that is creating it, what happens is it inverts. So now it's put over on this side. Okay? 
So we have the shadow in the Old Testament of the tabernacle. But again, now the shadow is passed through the object that created it. So now it comes, it's inverted, and it casts its light on this side. That's why when you come to the church, now you take the tabernacle, which was the type and shadow of things to come, as the light was shining out of Zion upon that cross. Are you with me here? Now it's inverted. So this shadow here comes over on the other side into the church. Does everybody understand that? So what we have then when you get into the age of grace, you have threes. You have three dimensions. Now from Adam here all the way to here, you have 7,000 years. Right? Right? But from here to here, 4,000 years to Christ, five, six, seven, you only have three days. So the third day in grace, or the seventh day, is the same thing as the third dimension in grace. Do you, does everybody, everybody understand that? Okay? Real important for you to get that. Now, so what is happening as we go through this, as you go through the New Testament, you're going to see threes. The number three is stamped all over the age of grace, okay? Death, burial, resurrection. You with me? Some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. You with me here? Do you understand that? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the light. The one place, way, the truth, and the life. Do you understand? So as you go through the New Testament, you're going to see these threes. Faith, hope, love. The greatest of these is love. So that's why when you get into the age of grace, it's stamped constantly with the number three because the number three is the same thing as the seventh. Okay? You with me here? Alright. So what we need to understand is is that the Lord's goal for us after the fall is to restore man back to the rest that he had before the fall. So we have 7,000 years laid out for the redemption of man. Okay? Amen? And ultimately, he'll bring us back to the rest. But when you talk about dimensions, because we have the Holy Ghost by the new birth, we can literally go in the Spirit to the seventh, amen, you with me? The seventh day or the third dimension in the Spirit. There, there is a rest that we can enter into right now where God does it all by Himself and all we do is respond to what He has already done. Are you all with me? Okay, say praise the Lord. Okay, go back to Hebrews chapter 4. Now, the problem we have is that we're trying to do our own thing all the time. Amen? Now, in order to enter into the rest of God, you have to cease from your own labors. You have to stop doing your own thing and start doing His thing. Okay? What God has already done. So, we got a problem here. It's right here. It's called unbelief. And unbelief hinders you and I from entering in to the rest of God. Uh, praise Lord. And I need this message. I don't know about you, but I need this message right now. I talked to a man in Colorado years and years ago. Uh, he was a pastor of a church, and he got completely burned out in ministry. I mean, the guy, the doctor told him, he said, if you don't stop pastoring, you're going to die. Okay? That's how exhausted the man was. Uh, so a doctor's order. If you don't stop pastoring, you're going to die. So I found this man over in Colorado in a little store uh, in Colorado. Basically, you know, I guess nobody knew where he was. And he was a pastor of a large church. But now he's over in this little store in, in, in no man's land. I mean, nobody's there. Okay, he's in nowhere. And, you know, every once in a while somebody come in the store. But that's where he was. And I found out this man was a pastor of a large church and, and the doctor told him, if you don't stop doing what you're doing, you're going to die. Okay? 
So he quit pastoring and he got, got over there. And I said, you know, I said, I believe the Lord has sent me. And I'm talking about, we're, we're talking about a, a little store way out in nowhere. Okay. We had to drive from where we were many, many miles to even get to this little store. And I walked into the store and in a short period of time, I found out his background. And I told him, I said, I'm going to share some things with you that will help you. Because it, this is why you're in the position you're in. Is because you were laboring and laboring and laboring and trying to do it all on your own, trying to carry it all by yourself, trying to make it happen all by yourself. And, and it basically killed you almost. I said, if you would understand this principle, and that is entering into the rest of God. Amen. Now we know we're labors together with God in the church age, but there is a dimension in God where you see God do it all by Himself. What you see God do, that's what you do. Amen. And, and it's God has already finished it. And so if you'll enter into the rest of God as you're serving the Lord, you're not, it won't kill you. Does that make sense to you? So this man, I don't know, I haven't heard anything from him. Uh, I told him about Jesus' name, baptism. I didn't know if he knew all about that. I told him about Jesus' name, baptism. I said, I'll tell you what. I'll come and baptize you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in this old cold water out here, this Colorado stream here. I'll come baptize you in Jesus' name. I said, it's going to be really cold. But I'll baptize you in Jesus' name and that'll be the beginning of you entering the rest. I never heard anything from you. But I shared the truth with the man. See? So what we need to understand is a people is that after the fall, man lost the rest. And he started laboring by himself like the brass of the, of the outer enclosure, laboring by himself. And then Jesus comes into the world after 4,000 years in the fifth and sixth day and he does a labor and he takes a bride and now we're labors together with God. But there's something beyond us laboring together with God that's available to us. It is seen that God has already finished everything. Amen. Amen. And, and as we see the completed work in, in the Lord, all we do is say, okay, God, what have you already done? And what you've already done, I'll enter into that. And there, there, it, that's what God wants us to have in the Spirit right now. We don't have to wait for the seventh day or the seven thousandth year when Jesus comes and sets up His kingdom to enter into that kind of rest right now. We can enter into that kind of rest, this seventh dimension operation of God where the glory of God is seen in the Holy of Holies, manifested His presence in the earth and God is doing the work. Amen? Amen. And people are seeing God. They're not seeing me. They're seeing God do the work. Hallelujah. Because I have entered into that place of glory. And glory is the manifest presence of God. So that's what God has for all of us. But we have to labor to enter into that rest. Because we're constantly wanting to do our own thing. God is saying, stop doing your own thing. Do what I have already finished. Amen. Just look into the heavens where, hallelujah, in, into eternity where, where things are already done. It is finished in eternity. Amen. So look in the Spirit into eternity where things are already done and believe God for that. Amen. So you don't have to make it happen on your own. You're trusting God. God's showing you I've already done it. Amen. I've already got that job for you. I've already got that relationship for you. I've already got this work in ministry for you. It's already done. Just walk in it. Amen. Just where it's, where it's in, in the spirit in eternity, it's already finished. Amen. Now listen, Jesus, when he was on the earth in John chapter 17, that high priestly prayer, he prays a prayer. Amen? In His humanity. And He said, I have finished the work. And He hadn't even been to the cross yet. But He said, I finished the work. Because in eternity, it's already done. And we just walk it out in time. So when Jesus, when He was praying, He entered into the dimension of eternity where things are already done. And He said, I finished the work. 
And he hadn't even been to the cross yet. You understand? Because he's speaking from the realm of eternity. So what I, you and I, and this is not, uh, this is so simple. It's your mind that makes it complicated. You and I simply have to get full of the Spirit of the living God and begin to see in the Spirit what God has already done. And as we do that, we are resting in Him. Amen. Give God praise. So, this is what God wants for us. Now, as you go through the New Testament, you will see Jesus doing things on the Sabbath day. Like a Sabbath day healing will take place. It's, uh, it moves you beyond the church only. It takes you into another dimension beyond the church. The church is not everything. Amen. The church flows out of the kingdom. So Jesus will do a seventh day healing, a seventh day miracle. It's a picture and a type of a dimension that's even beyond where we are called the church. Okay. Y'all with me here? If you are, say praise the Lord. Even the name Adam and Eve has the same pattern laid in it. Adam, A-D-A-M, Eve, E-V-E. -E. Okay, Adam, A-D-A-M, four, 4,000 years. The fifth day and the sixth day, Jesus takes his Eve, the bride. The last part of her name, Eve, takes you into the kingdom. Okay? So God wants you to understand this. And I know sometimes when you get, when I'm teaching you on this level, you have a tendency just to want to shut it all off. Because, because you, you might think, or the enemy wants you to think it's too complicated to understand. It's not. It's so basic. It is so simple that God laid out in these 24 hour creative days here, He laid out another day, thousand year days, seven thousand years for man's redemption, and He lays out four thousand 2,000 more and another 1,000. In the church age, it's 2,000 plus 1. 3 is the same as 7. But it's all pointing to the rest of God. What keeps us from entering into that rest? Well, we know the fall of man. When man fell, he lost that rest, that spiritual rest. And so we have, as it says here, a future Sabbath. Jesus, our God, rested from all that He had made in the creative week. But God, amen, after the fall, He started working a different way. And that was to redeem you and I so that we could enter back into the rest of God that was lost in the Garden of Eden. Amen? Now, the seventh day is not Sunday. The seventh day is Saturday. And, <clears throat> Amen? The Jewish people kept the seventh day as a day of rest to commemorate what I'm telling you today. But Hebrews chapter 4 is very clear that when they were in the promised land, the land of rest, they didn't rest. They had a day, a seventh day, and they were in the land of rest, but the day didn't produce rest for them, nor the land produced rest for them. Amen? You with me? Do you understand that? Because it comes by redemption. It's not by physical, a physical day or a physical land that brings rest to you. It is, that was a type and a shadow. The promised land was a type and a shadow of the rest of God. The Sabbath day was a type and a shadow of the rest of God. And that's what Hebrews 4 is very clear about here. So let's read it so you'll get it. Are you with me? Verse 6. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of what? It was first preached to who? To Israel. But they didn't enter into the rest. And they had the Sabbath day. But God says they didn't enter into the rest. But they were keeping the Sabbath day. But they didn't enter into the rest. They went into the land of promise, but they were not resting. Wow. Are you with me? Verse 7. Again, he limited the certain day, saying to, in David, today, after so long a time, 
as it is said, today if you will hear His voice, harden not your hearts. He said even in David's day, they had not entered into His rest. They've been in the land and they've been observing the Sabbath day. Uh, David, all the way up to the, to the time of David. Do you understand that? Praise God. We're talking about 1,000. Amen. B.C. They hadn't entered into the rest of God. We're going to go back to Moses in 1500. 500 years later. When they're in the land, David is the king. They still haven't entered into the rest of God. Now he goes on and he says, he talks about Joshua. Look at it. Verse 8. For if Jesus or Joshua had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. He said these people didn't experience the rest of God in Joshua's day. They didn't experience the rest of God in David's day. So he said, I'm speaking of another day. Now watch. Verse 9, he says, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his... Oh, there it is. How do you enter into his rest? By ceasing from your own works as God did from his. You stop doing your own thing. You enter into the rest of God. And you labor to enter into the rest of God, but you've ceased from your own labors. And you've entered into a dimension where God has already done it for you. Okay? Starts with salvation. The new birth. Verse 10, For he that has entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. So he says, there remains a rest for the people of God. It's available to you. But what keeps you from experiencing or entering to that rest of God is unbelief. Okay? So what do we do with this unbelief that we have up here? Verse 12. For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to dividing the center of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It's the Word of God that comes. It's quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It deals with that unbelief. Okay? So every time I preach the word of the Lord, so you would not believe what I feel when I stand behind this pulpit. The unbelief that I have to overcome in myself, in my mind, and the unbelief that I feel in you. It is a constant battle. And I have to labor to get through that myself. And I have to labor to get that, to get you into a place of rest. Because of all the unbelief that is in us, but there is a rest, amen, there remains a rest for the people of God where God has finished it. It's already done. And when you got born again, the rest of God entered into you and now you labor to walk in that rest with God as you cease to do your own thing and do His thing and allow the Word of God to deal with that unbelief that's in your mind. Verse 13. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of Him which with whom we have to do. Are you with me here? Okay. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched by the feeling of our infirmities, but, by, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto where? The throne of grace, the seventh dimension that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Have you ever been in the place where you are just exhausted spiritually, emotionally, and physically? And you go into the prayer room and you start praying and as you pray and the, the Spirit of God is, is manifesting in your life and you walk out of there refreshed, replenished, strengthened. Amen? Where did it come from? 
you stopped doing your own thing and you entered into His rest. And you walk out in victory. You walk out in power. Amen. Because it's in the Spirit. So to, today, in the Spirit, it's always today. It's not tomorrow. In the Spirit, we don't have to wait for the seventh day or the seventh millennium. In the Spirit, today, you can enter into that dimension where God has already done. He's already finished it. Right before I came to church, I almost came late today. Because right before I came to church, you know, my sleeping patterns are really strange. And I got up, you know, I was up at about 7 o'clock, man, bright eyed. And, and then I laid down, back down to rest a few minutes, and I went back to sleep, and I had a dream. I mean, right before I came to church. And it was a spiritual dream. And I saw literally a, a move of God and a manifestation of God's presence in an end time work here that, that was Colosseum in proportion. I saw people that I have never seen before playing uh, this instrument before God with songs I've never heard sung before. There are people yet that you have not even seen yet, that you don't even know about yet, that God has already created for this type, this end time type of manifestation of His glory. It's bigger than you can even imagine. And so, I saw people recently baptized in Jesus' name there. I saw people I had never, had never seen before there. It wasn't in this building. It was so big, there were stairs leading up to places for people to sit. There is a, there's a, a woman of God that, that the Lord has raised up to intercede for this church in this hour. She was in that dream. And she was praying. And she was interceding. Amen. And God showed me her intercessory prayer. I'm just telling you right now, God is doing things supernaturally. But the problem is sometimes we get so wrapped up in our own thing and what we're doing and, and how we're trying to make it happen. And I believe personally before I came to church today, God said, I'm going to show you something. And He gave me that dream. And I'm talking about huge. Now, I don't know what where I'm supposed to go with that. I don't know what I'm supposed to do with that. I don't have any idea, but it's not my problem. Because if that's what God wants to do, all I have to do is just, as God opens the door, Walk through the door. Do you understand what I'm saying? Amen. So there, right now, today, in the Spirit, it's always today. It's not about tomorrow. It's what, what are you doing now, God? And, and as I see what you're doing now, God, I enter into that dimension. Does, does anybody understand what I'm saying? And this is something that that man, I feel led to share with you, that I met over in Colorado, that pastor who had a doctor's order to stop pastoring because he was about to die. That's what I told that man. I said, you had labored and labored and labored and built and built and built until you were exhausted. It's because you didn't understand entering into God's rest. You were about there. You were doing the work of the Lord. And see, that's what we do as a church. I'm going to do the work. You're going to do the work of the Lord? Really? You and I are going to do the work of the Lord? No, when we enter into this dimension, it's God doing it through you. It's God doing it through me. Things I couldn't do or you couldn't accomplish if you wanted to or you tried to. But it's supernatural enabling of God. Amen. Where you've ceased from your own labors. You've stopped trying to do the work of God. And you're letting God do His work through you. And that's where God wants us to be in the Spirit. Hallelujah. God has already done things in your life. He's already done things in my life. There's no way I could have done it. There's no way you could have done it. But it was God stepping in. God doing it for you. And all you had to do is just wait on the voice of the Lord. And the Lord said, do this. And when you did that, it came to pass. And God said, now I, I, my testimony is so large, it would blow your mind. But it's simply trusting God and hearing the voice of the Lord and saying, alright, do this. And 
and you do it, you obey Him. He's already done it. Real quick, real fast, quick testimony. Amen. Not long ago, I felt led of the Lord to put our house on the market. It was, I believe it was the Lord. We've been wrestling with this for years. Is it time? And so we felt it was the Lord's will to do it. So we put the house on the market. And it was so within a few few months. God did it. That house that we just sold, I had no desire to even be in that house. I was doing just fine living in another house and, and we happened to go over there to find a, a, um, a playground for the church kids. A doctor over in that area was selling the playground and so we went over there to look at the playground. And when we went to look at the playground and went around the block and saw that house was for sale, I told my wife, I want that house. God made a way. I moved into that house. Not long ago, we felt led of the Lord to sell that house. Are y'all with me? For almost twice what we paid for it. Did you hear what I said? We sold the house for almost twice what we paid for it. We brought the tithe of the increase to the Lord happily. Happily. Amen. We moved from that house by faith into another house. And that house just happened to be one I just happened to drive by one day. And I told my wife, I said, I found the house. She said, you did. I said, yeah, let me tell you the address. So she said, I think I know the house you're looking at. Do you know how much they're asking for that house? And I told her what I thought it, the house, looking on the outside, you know, what I thought it would cost to get. She said, no, it wasn't, it, you're not even close. I said, well, I guess that means I better stop looking at this one. But I really felt in my spirit the same thing that happened to the other house happened to this one. The Lord said, that one is it. So we went through the process, you know, what is God's will? And uh, we just kept coming back to this house, coming back to this house. And when it seemed impossible, God said, it's not impossible with me. All things are possible with me. So we moved in after we sold that house. Amen. Our old house. Then we moved into this house by faith and we started sweating it just a little bit. I say sweating. That's man laboring. <laughs> you start sweating it, that's man laboring. Amen. And all kinds of obstacles were coming up to try to stop the, the closing date and all of this, you know. Hallelujah. And all I could do was hold on to a word that God had given me before we sold the first house and that was this. And I was in the process of preparing a message to preach on the prophet Ezekiel. Y'all remember the message not long ago on a Sunday night that I preached in Ezekiel. And I was early in the morning and I was praying. And the Lord said to me, don't worry about that stuff. I've got it taken care of. You focus on this message. You leave the rest to me. So I said, all right, praise God. It sounds great to me. Hallelujah. So I focused on the message on the prophet Ezekiel that I preached to you that night and there was just a mighty move of God in that service. And I, I, I'm telling you the truth. A few days later, the Lord took care of that. The man was having problem finan getting financing for the house. You know how long it takes banks to get financing done? I didn't know he had the capability. But when the banks were slowing the process up, he just went and paid cash for it. And almost instantly we went from a problem to closing. I got a call that day from the realtor, you know, and, and I'm talking about, I think it was around 2.30. I got, a, I got a text from him, can you be there at 3? I said, sure. <laughs> 30 minutes. You better believe I'll be there. The man paid cash for my house. Praise the Lord. So the Lord took care of it just like He told me He would. And we were able to take a large down payment from the house that we sold and put it on this house. Hallelujah to the man. And that's what I'm talking about right there. If you learn to walk with God, and, and if I learn to trust God, and sometimes you start sweating and you start worrying about all of these things, if we will enter into His rest where it's already done, and we'll just hear His voice, and just uh, just act and respond to the voice of the Lord that we're hearing. That's what I'm talking about. 
Well, end of testimony. After sweating it a little bit, we closed on that house. Amen. Signed, sealed, and delivered. That's the kind of God we serve. I said, that's the kind of God we serve. He said, well, does he care about all that? You better believe it. He cares about it. He cares about your life. That's what I'm preaching to you this morning. And the title of this message is, The Care of God for His People. When you talk about Adam and Eve being created and, and the perfection of the creation and placed in the garden, so on, that is the care of God for His people. Hallelujah. He wants to bless your life. But you and I have got to stop trying to do it on our own. Because every time you try to do it on your own, you're going to mess it up. But if you let God tell you and lead you and guide you and show you what He has for you, you don't have to worry about it. So when he starts giving me a dream right before I come to church, it's almost made me late. Hallelujah. About this mighty manifestation of his presence. And this is not the first time it's happened. It's happened to me through the years. But it, you know, isn't it something that sometimes before the manifestation of God comes, it seems like it's going in the other direction? Have you ever noticed before the promise comes? You have the promise, but before it's in realized, before it's real, it seems like everything is dead and there's no way it can happen. Your womb is dead. And God said, I promised you a child. How? My womb is dead. It just seems like that right before the promise is, is materialized or manifest in your life. It seems like it's all dead. It's not gonna, it's not gonna live. Hallelujah. That's when God's supernatural power steps in and says, I'm going to show you, it's not about you doing it, it's about me doing it miraculously, supernaturally, by my power and by my ability. There, there remains a rest for the people of God, but you've got to labor to enter into that rest because unbelief will come into your mind and say, no, 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 I will settle for this. God says, no, I have so much more for you. So where is the uh, where's the problem? It's in our it's it's between our ears. It's in your mind. It's in my mind. It's unbelief. And that's why listen, I have preached through the years, hallelujah, to myself as well as to you to get you out of that loser mentality and to believe God for so much more than you could ever do on your own. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. And when He starts blessing your life, don't get, don't get, you know, full of... Hallelujah. Don't get cheap on Him. He starts blessing your life. You reciprocate that into the kingdom. You sow into the kingdom. Hallelujah. My wife said, well, said, you know, not that she didn't want to, but she said, but Jerry, I'm going to ask you a question. We're going to take this money, the increase that we made off the other house, and we're going to sow it into another house. So, should we bring the tithe if we're going to do that? I said, you better believe it. No, not, not that she, she doubted, she just had the question. I said, you better believe it, because that's a present increase, and I'm going to bring the tithe on a present increase. Gladly, hallelujah to the Lamb. You know, and, and I'm, I'm, there's a lot of curiosity with who moved into the house, you know. I've already got neighbors knocking on the door to see who moved into that house. <laughs> Hallelujah. And they, you know, they always have that question, what do you do? I'm a pastor. <laughs> Amen. The guy that built the house, the builder of the house. Amen. Tell you a little bit about him because I got to talk to him. He's got a million dollar box in Dallas Cowboys Stadium. That's where he sits to watch the game. Amen. 
Well, he already told me, he said, I, you just call me up sometime and I'll get you, you know, two or $3,000 tickets for $350. It's all food supplied and everything. Just call me when you want to go. I said, well, I passed her on Sundays. I don't know when I can go. But he, he offered it to me. But I got to witness to him about Jesus' name, baptism, the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. I got to talk to him. He said, where's your church? Praise the Lord. See, God is doing something right now. God cares. I said, God cares. He cares about you. He cares about that, that man that built the house that I live in right now. He cares. I said, God cares. So when you look at Genesis chapter 2, the, the title of it is, the whole thing, the theme of it is God cares about you. He wants you to enter into His rest where it's already done. All Adam had to do is wake up into the rest of God and go out and reap what God had already done. God had already put the trees in the garden with the fruit on the tree. God had already put the minerals and the precious stones in the garden. It was already there. The water was already there. It was already there and they woke up in a finished work and looked around and saw what the Lord did and what life can be like you see Hebrews is very clear about this there remains a rest for the people of God God wants you in the Spirit to enter into that kind of rest right now that was in the Garden of Eden. God is trying to bring us back to what was lost in Adam. That's His goal and His purpose. Say praise the Lord. God cares about you and He cares about me. If we'll trust Him. But between our ears, the doubt and the unbelief and all that goes on with that is what we have to labor to overcome. No, God said, I'm healed. I'm healed. God said, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. God said, I'm delivered. I'm delivered. Are you here today? Say praise the Lord. So, as your pastor, I'm, I'm really trying to practice what I preach. Where I see what the Lord has already done. And go forth and let God do it through me. And let God do it through you. You can be miserable if you want to. But God doesn't want you miserable. It is not God. God didn't make you for destruction. God made you to be the sons of God. He made you to be blessed. You can go through life fussing and fighting and full of jealousy and all kinds of carnality if you want to. But God made you to be His sons. That you might enter into His rest. And in case you don't know it, are y'all here today? It doesn't always come by the laying on of hands. It comes by inheritance. There's th some things that you and I receive from God that come by inheritance because you have a Father in your life. And God gives you a father. Are you with me? God provides a father, but He gives you generation. Because you're willing to be under a spiritual father, God gives you generation. And His ultimate goal is to bring you into the rest. So it brings me Nick, to the next point. He talks about the generations of the heavens and the earth. How many are thankful for what God has already done? Verse 4. These are the generations. The Toledot in the Hebrew. The Toledot in the Hebrew. The word Toledot in the Hebrew has two valves in it. Now don't lose what I'm saying. Listen to what I'm saying. A valve is a Hebrew letter in the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, a valve is a hook. The word generation in Genesis 2 and 4 has two hooks in it or two valves in it in the Hebrew word toledot. After the fall of man, the word generation only has one valve in it, one hook. The valve means... The Hebrew letter Vav means redemption 
and completion. When man falls in the garden, in Genesis 2, 4, two valves are used. Redemption and completion are used in the Hebrew word toledot. Genesis 2, 4, the, the English word of generation. After the fall, only one is in that Hebrew word toledot. And it's all the way in the Old Testament that way until you get to the book of Ruth in the fourth chapter. Go to the fourth chapter of the book of Ruth. I thought I was going to be able to preach all the way to the fourth chapter, but it doesn't seem like I'm going to be able to. But I want you to see this because God wants you to see His greatness. When man fell, he lost perfection. He lost completion. And so one of the valves disappeared out of the word generation. When you get to the book of Ruth in the fourth chapter, somebody say amen. amen. How many of y'all want, want more than what you got amen. in God? Labor to enter into His rest. He cares. In the book of Ruth, hallelujah, I just love Him. I love Him. I love Him. Nobody can stop your blessing. The devil can't stop your blessing. When he gets ready to bless you, nobody can. Look at your neighbor and say, I believe God. In the fourth chapter of the book of Ruth, you'll see another you'll see this English word again. Generations. Verse 18. Now these are the generations told a dote of Perez. Perez beget Hezron. Hezron beget Ram. Ram beget Aminadab, Aminadab beget Nashon, Nashon beget Salmon, Salmon beget Boaz, Boaz beget Obed, Obed beget Jesse, and Jesse beget David. And who is the son of David? Jesus. So that when you get to Ruth chapter 4 and verse 18, the Hebrew word in Toledot generations, the valve has returned. When we have the messianic line, the generation, the line of Jesus Christ. Because it's by Him that we're hooked back to God, connected back to God. And by Him we are redeemed. And by Him we are completed. And by Him we are perfected. Give the Lord praise in the house. So that what was lost in the fall, even generationally, will be restored by Jesus Christ in His redemptive work. Verse 4, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth. As you go through the book of Genesis, you're going to see that word generation, generation, generation. There's ten generations in the book of Genesis. Ten generations. Are you with me? This one here, the generations of the heavens and the earth. In Genesis 5 and verse 1, we have the generations of Adam. You just keep on going. You'll have the generations of Noah and so on and so forth. Just keep going through the book of generations and you're going to see ten generations. And what is their effect on the purpose of God? Okay? Ultimately, perfection and completion in the Messiah. But before the fall, Adam was in a state. Are you with me? Of completion. So that he woke up where everything was already complete. Where it was already finished. Hallelujah. But when man disobeyed the Lord. He lost that rest and he lost that perfection. Let's keep reading. Again, the care of God, verse 5, and every plant of the field before it was... Ha! Look at that. Before it was in the earth. You with me? And every herb of the field before it grew, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth and there was not a man to till the ground. He made the heavens and the earth. Hallelujah. And the Bible tells us very something the plants of the fields and the herbs of the fields before it grew. Hallelujah. God transplanted all this, put it right into the earth. He didn't take and put it in seed form and then grow from a seed. He took it in full grownness. Full grownness before the fall, maturity, and put it, transplanted it from his greenhouse into the earth. 
And then after that, it would be seed time and harvest. The trees that were full grown produced the seeds that would later produce more and more. But when God, are you with me? When He first did it, He wasn't in seed form. He took everything in maturity. He transplanted it out of His greenhouse and put it in the garden for man. So that when man woke up, it was already done. Verse 6 there's one, one thing verse 5 tells us that there's a need of and that there's not a man to till the ground. So God's going to take care of that need too. He's going to make a man to till the ground. So we see labor before the fall. Labor is not a result of sin. Hard labor is. Labor is a God thing. So we see here one thing needing a man to till it. And then verse 6, but there went up a midst from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. An underground sprinkler system has been around a long time. It didn't rain. It hadn't rained from the heavens. God said, I'll just put an underground sprinkler system and all that water that's in the heart of the earth that when the flood takes place, it pushes itself up through the heavens, 70 miles straight up into the heavens and knocks a hole in the, the rakia, that canopy. And the waters flood down. And the waters flow up. All that water that was down there, he said, I'll just cause it to sprinkle or water the ground. An underground sprinkler system. Hallelujah. You thought you were the first one that had that. The care of God for His people. All these trees, fruits on the tree to enjoy to eat. Underground sprinkler system. Verse 7 of the Lord God formed man. Say formed man of the dust of the ground. The word formed. God did it with His own hands. Like a potter working with a pot of clay. God didn't do that with any other creature. Only with man. He formed the man. He shaped man like, like you would a vessel of clay. What's he saying to you? He didn't do that for the animals. He did that for man because he cares that much that he would form you. Genesis 1 says you were created in his image. You with me? Special care was given. You don't think God loves you? You don't think God cares? Special care to form man. He formed it out of the dust of the ground. This is not pulverized earth. This is moist earth. It's clay that he could take and form and mold into a man. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. The breath of life was a plural term. He didn't just get physical life. He got spiritual life. And man became a living soul. He comes in contact with the earth, the physical realm, with his body. He comes in contact with himself self in the soul realm. And he comes in contact with God by his spirit. The Bible says he breathed in his nostrils the breath of life. A plural word. Verse 8, the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed. Notice the garden was eastward. See, Eden is the location. But God said, I'm going to plant, I'm going to put a garden eastward in Eden. Y'all understand that? This is awesome. So that the garden is not Eden. He put the garden in Eden. Are y'all here? The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there He put man whom He had formed. Hallelujah. Paradise. A garden. Paradise is a garden enclosed. This Eden, this garden, the, uh, the garden of Eden, the garden that was in Eden, that God put in Eden, it was enclosed, it was walled. And if you look in Genesis chapter 3, the Bible talks about the cherubim on the eastern side of Eden. It makes directional references in this chapter here. So that lets us know that the entry gate into this garden that was enclosed by walls was on the east side of the garden. And you had to go through the east gate to get into the garden. 
But John chapter 10 tells us that the thief climbed over the wall. The devil leaped over the wall to get into the garden. He didn't go into the appointed place, the appointed way. If you study the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 28, you'll see that Eden was a holy mountain of God. That this, this Eden that get, the Eden and the garden that God put in that Eden was on a mountain. It was the mountain of God. And the waters cascaded down from the mountains. One river flowing out of the Garden of Eden into four heads, as the scripture says here, water cascading down from the mountain of God called Eden. All because he cared that much. He put man whom he had formed in that garden, which means he wasn't formed in the garden. He was formed somewhere outside of the garden. And God put him in that paradise place. He put him in the holy of holies. The garden of garden. Uh, the garden of Eden is the holy of holies. Eden is the holy place. And the world is the outer court. But God took him and put him in the holy of holies before the fall. Paradise. So he wasn't made in the garden. He was made outside of the garden. He was put in, in, in that place, that garden in paradise. The Bible said, verse 9, Out of the ground made the Lord God to grow up every tree that is pleasant to the sight. Why did he, why, hallelujah you with me? Why did he have those trees in the garden? They were growing in the garden. Why? Pleasant to the sight, something beautiful to look at. Good for food. Because you never say good eating. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden say life. You see, God did it. He did it for beauty's sake. He did it for food's sake. And He did it for life. And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and also for knowledge. That's why he put those trees in there for beauty, for food, amen, for life and for knowledge. Of course, he forbade man to eat that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Verse 10, and here comes that river cascading down from the mountain of God. The river speaks of salvation throughout the word of the Lord. It is literal water here. But it speaks of salvation. It speaks of the Spirit of the Lord flowing out in four directions to reach the whole world out of the Holy of Holies. The garden. Eden. The holy place. To water the whole earth in four directions. Salvation. The Bible tells us this refreshing river. The river went out of Eden to water the garden. And from thence it parted and became into four heads. The name of the first was Pison. That is which compasseth the whole land of Havilah. Where there is what? Gold. And the gold of the land is good. There is Bedellium and the onyx stone. You see what he's showing you here? He sent out in, there in Eden and... And connected to this water flow, he said there's precious stones and there's minerals and they were just laid out all over the ground, scattered out by the goodness of God. For man to enjoy, what does that speak of? The tremendous blessings of God for man. He didn't have to go down and dig way down and get the gold like they do today. It was all scattered on the top of the ground. It was everywhere. How would you like to be living in that kind of age where all you had to do is just walk out there and pick up the gold and silver and all kinds of precious stones just laying out scattered all over the ground, fluttered. Why? Because that's, that shows you the abundant blessings of God for man. God's the one that, that put the value on these things. Somebody say, where does the value come for gold? It came from God. So we have this water flowing into four heads and we got the gold and we got the, 
we got this bdellium and we got this onyx stone and the name of the second river is Gihon. The same as that compasses the whole land of Ethiopia. And the name of the third river is Hittakel, that is, which goeth toward the east of Assyria. And the fourth is Euphrates. So verse 14, Hittakel and Euphrates. We're very aware of those. They're still around. The Tigris and the Euphrates River. But we, we because of the flood, Bison and Gihon, we don't know where they are. So this, this one water flowing out, watering the garden, going out from there to the four, these four heads that touch the earth. Because why? God cares. After God gets through dealing with the sight, verse 15, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the, into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Amen. Labor, but not hard labor. Labor that's in the rest of God. Laboring to enter into the rest of God. Laboring to experience the blessings that are laying out all the ground. Laboring to enter into the water that's flowing out. Laboring to simply go up there and pick the fruit that God had already made for you. Where it was already done. That was the labor. That's all it was. It wasn't hard. That's how... It God cares. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying of every tree of the garden, Thou mayest freely eat. The next thing God does is He puts laws that govern it. Somebody say, well, the law came by Moses. and so we're not longer under the law. You're talking about the law, the law of Moses? Well, the ceremonial law is fulfilled in Christ. The moral law is still binding on us today. It's not done away with. But aside from that, all I want you to understand is this, is that from the very beginning, God placed laws to govern paradise. If the universe didn't have laws that controlled it, if the stars didn't have laws to control it, if the universe, come on somebody, everything is governed by law. And if there were no laws, everything would be in chaos. God in His kindness and His love for man put boundaries on man. We call it law. So people say, I don't like the laws of God because they're too restrictive. Really? You say, I don't like the laws of God because they take my joy away. Mm -mm. In John, he, John says in the New Testament, His law is not grievous. He didn't give His law to take your joy away. He didn't give His law to kill your joy. He gave His law to protect your joy and to protect my joy. If you don't have laws that govern you or boundaries in your life, you have nothing but chaos and confusion and death and destruction. You need the laws of God. You need the boundaries of God. It comes from the hand of a loving God to protect that joy. He cares. All of these things He gave man. He told him He could eat all the, of all the trees of the garden except this one. What a small prohibition. Look at your neighbor and say, a small prohibition. You know how the devil talks to you? Living for God's too restrictive. I want my freedom. Living for God, I don't like those laws or those boundaries. You step outside of them, you find out what you get. You don't have joy, you don't have peace. You have chaos. You have death. Those laws are given to protect that joy. Amen. He cares about us. One small prohibition. God said, you could have all the trees in the garden, but one. That's it. But you know what the devil does to you? He comes to you and says, God's too hard. God's unfair. His restrictions are too difficult. His prohibitions. You don't want to live for that God. One small prohibition. 
in contrast, he said, you can have all the rest of it. It's the devil that comes to you and tells you that living for God is too restrictive. It's the devil that comes to you and tells you his laws are too hard. It's the devil that tells you or gets you to focus on the negative instead of the positive. To focus on the burden instead of the blessing. Really, when you look at it all together, in a lot of everything, all the blessings that God gives us and everything that He does for us, and He gives us very, very few prohibitions to protect your joy. In, in comparison to all the trees of the garden, you may freely eat, but of this one, don't eat it. How many know what I'm preaching is the truth? How many has the enemy ever come to you and says, Oh, living for God's hard. Amen? You can't bring your tithe. You'll starve to death. It's too, too restrictive. It's too hard. Left. Really? Small. God is so good. Hallelujah. Let me, I'm just, you know, I might as well preach on tithing since I've already gone there. He's so good. You get to keep nine tenths. And all he says is, Bring me one tent, the small. You get to keep everything else. But he's so good, he says, if you bring me the one tenth, I'll count it as the whole. I won't just count it as one tenth of your income. He said, if you bring me the one tenth, the part, I'll count it as if you brought the whole thing to me. That's how good God is. But you know how the devil is. It's hard to live for God. One small prohibition. Look at it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. Every tree. Look at that. The largeness of God's goodness. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. There was no death before the fall. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. Further care given after he gives the laws, the boundaries that protect the life of man. So he would not die. In God's goodness, he said, you know, Adam is by himself right now. He needs a help meet. For companionship. Amen. Somebody... Okay, from companionship, somebody to help him. The priority in God's kingdom is man's occupation. The woman helps the man perform what God calls him to do. His occupation is the priority. Except in the kingdom of God, if you have headship, if you have a covering, a woman can, can function in the office of apostle and prophet as long as there is headship in place. But rulership is placed with the man. And the woman helps the man do his occupation. The priority is on him. Say, man, now some of you ladies say, well, I'm not married. Well, praise God, you're married to Jesus. And his will is the purpose for you. Okay, so, but he's so good. Lord God said, it's not good that man should be alone. See, God wants good for you. He wants you to have a relationship as long as it's in his will. It's not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helpmeet for him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And Whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. Say praise the Lord. So Adam's got to have a lot of help. 
because he's fixing to have to name. Well, when God formed these animals, he didn't form them like, like he did Adam. And, and he's, they need to be named. How many of y'all are very good in school with, with remembering names of animals and things? Anybody here good at that? Is that biology? The study of life? My son's studying biology right now. I promise you I'm almost done. Aren't you glad I'm not going to the fourth chapter? My, my, my son's, he's studying about all these microbes and all this kind of, I'm going, man, they got names that long. Adam's got a huge job to do. He's got to name all the animals, but his brain capacity was such that he could. It's no problem. So he watched the animals go by. He watched the rooster go by with his hen. He watched the buck go by with his doe. So on and so forth. And as he began to name them, he noticed something that each one had a companion. And he looked around and he said, none of these look like me. Say amen. Brought him to Adam to see what he would call them and whatsoever Adam called every living creature. That was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to fowl of the air and every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helpmeet for him. Where's mine? Are you with me? When did this happen? After the sixth day, after they'd entered into the rest of God. They've already entered into the rest of God. When did, when did Adam take his bride? After the sixth day. When is Jesus going to come back and take his bride? After 6,000 years. He wants you to know it's echoed. Adam receiving his bride is echoing when Jesus will receive his bride. It's echoed. The Bible says, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep, say a deep sleep, to fall upon Adam. And he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman, and he brought her unto the man. He took the curvy part of Adam. That's what the word rib means, the curvy part. Thank you, Jesus. So that his wife came out of him. Amen? Now, okay, so all you scientists out there, you're going to go home and you're going to count your ribs. Boom, 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 boom. And if you're married to your wife, you're going to count hers. And you're going to see if she's got more ribs than you do. I will tell you, you're wasting your time. you got the same amount of ribs as she does. She has the same amount of ribs as you do. What, what's happening here is God is taking out of the man his helpmate. The rib means the curvy part of Adam. That's why she's got curves and you don't. Amen. Now notice, God doesn't make homosexuals. He made a man and a woman. He doesn't make homosexuals. He doesn't make transsexuals. Amen. He didn't make Adam and Steve. He made Adam and Eve. It's just the enemy that wants to pervert you. He took the curvy part out of Adam as Adam is sleeping. And we do know that when Jesus died on the cross and his side was pierced while he was dead, outflowed water, blood and water, that's when the bride was born. Came out of Jesus while he was asleep. The rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman, brought her unto man. And Adam said, 
This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She has the same nature that I do. Not inferior to Adam. All you ladies out there, you are not inferior to the man. You are subject to the man, but you are not inferior to him. He is not superior to you. You were created in the image of God just like the man was. I'll say it again. You are not inferior and He is not superior. You are just in subjection. Aren't you glad to know that? I had a couple of you there that had enough courage to say amen. You know, it's hard for us, us men, right, to accept the fact that our wives are probably a lot smarter than we are. I know you don't believe it. You look at her and you think, you're so superior, you're so smart. You might be physically stronger than her, but she's probably got you beat in the brains department. And she's for sure more sensitive to the spirit than you are. So in some things, you need to listen to her because God will always stand on the side of right whether you be a man or not. If she's right, He'll stand with her. Watch, old man. Do you love your wife? So, can you imagine... God takes that curvy part out of Adam and forms this beautiful woman. Hallelujah. There's no fall here. Praise God. And, and God is the one who performed the first marriage ceremony, the first nuptials. I know y'all like that word. I like that word too. Nuptial just means marriage. He performed the first nuptials of the marriage in the garden. And can you imagine what Adam must have thought when God made woman Ish? He's man is Ish and Isha. He's Ish and she's Isha. Woman in the Hebrew Isha. And so all of a sudden, he wakes up from sleep and he sees her. Hallelujah. I promise you, he goes. Isha. Amen? I'm turning red up here. Hallelujah. Man, I can feel it. I don't feel it all the time, but I feel it right now. I'm turning red. Oh, you men, don't you, you act like you don't, don't know what I'm talking about. But it was before the fall and they were not in sin. And so when 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 she looked at him or he looked at her because there was no sin. Amen? There was nothing wrong. He just had a beautiful Isha. He's got his helpmate. This is all a picture of Jesus and the church. We came out of him. He's Ish and we're Isha. He's the last Adam. You are the new Eve. The church is the new Eve. You need to get out of that old Adam, that old Adamic nature, that old fallen nature, and get under the new headship of Jesus Christ as the last Adam so that you can be the new Eve. But notice this. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Same nature. She shall be called Isha or woman, my lady, because she was taken out of man. Hallelujah. She's not called Eve until after the fall, the mother of all living. After the fall. Is your wife your lady? Or is she just the mother of your kids? If she's just the mother of your kids, you're going to have all kinds of marital problems. She has to first be your woman, your lady, my Isha. And then after she's your lady, She's the mother of your kids. Amen? In closing, she was taken out of man.
Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and they shall be what? One flesh. A man shall leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Marriage is so sacred in the eyes of God that literally the words that are using right here, that are being used right here when marriage takes place, you are abandoning mama and daddy in order that you might care for her and care for him. In marriage, it has to be that way. And if dad and mom are always interjecting and always putting their foot in everything and trying to take control of everything in between the husband and the wife, there's going to be great problems in the home because there has been a literally a separation from that responsibility of being under your dad and your mom. Now you are literally glued to that woman and the responsibility is now there. It has to be that way. If every time you have a problem, you call up dad and mama, he didn't treat me right. Every time you have a problem, he picks up the phone and says, Mama, help me. I promise you, problems are going to be in your marriage. Now, you can call your pastor. He'll help you. But don't call mom and daddy and talk to them about all your problems because they're going to start hating him or her. Say, leaving and cleaving. Hallelujah. A lot of jealousy takes place too. When mama loses the son, when he leaves and cleaves, she still wants her baby back. So she comes up with all kinds of excuses, making him dinner, knocking on his door, said, I brought you dinner, honey. She won't let him go. Hallelujah. Most of the time when the girl goes, it's goodbye, good riddance. Uh, Sister Victoria. <laughs> goodbye. Thank God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> yeah, I'm, you, know, you know I'm kidding. I love her. Amen. But, but that's the truth. It's really hard for mama to let the boy go. Brought y'all dinner. Hallelujah. You, how many want your marriage to function right? Yeah. Then mom and dad got to stay out of it. And the Bible says they become one flesh. Jesus, as God permit, you know, performed the first marriage ceremony, they become one flesh. There's unity there. Unity. They consummate the marriage physically. Unity physically. But physical, the physical is not the only thing. Amen? Chewing on each other all day long is not the only reason why you got married. There's unity physically, but there must be unity in your decisions, unity of purpose in your life. That's one reason why coming to church and being in the kingdom of God is so important. It's so that you can walk with God and be in agreement with God and do what God wants you to do in His life. There has to be a union physically. There has to be a union spiritually. There has to be a union uh, socially. It's not just physical. It's social and spiritual. If you leave the spiritual out, your marriage will suffer more than you can ever begin to imagine. You leave the soul, the emotion out, it will suffer if the physical is all you got. You got to work on the physical, you got to work on the emotion, the soul, you got to work on the spirit to make a strong marriage. Hallelujah. And so here they are in the marriage. In marriage, they're in unity, they're in one flesh. Praise God. Hallelujah. And what God had joined together, let no man separate. With all the blessings of God and the water flowing and riches everywhere and all they had to do is go and pick the fruit off the tree and eat it. 
Man, they've got relationship. They've got companionship. It's all good. That shows you how much God cares. Amen. But the most important thing, as they are there before the fall, they are covered with glory, not with clothing. Inward glory and outward glory. So that when they look at each other, they were not ashamed because there was no sin. Shame comes because of sin. They looked at each other and there was no shame. The glory was there. And most importantly, above all these things that God prepared for man in that garden, on that mountain, was His presence. A glory cloud would come into that place. The glory cloud was the RV of God the recreational vehicle of God. He came down and you would hear Him coming. Sounded like a jet flying in. And the voice of the Lord would walk in the garden in the cool of the day to have fellowship with Adam. In this first, in this new creation, in His firstborn he would have relationship with Adam and angels would fellowship with Adam in the earth. And, and, and Adam could see the angels and the angels could see Adam and they would communicate with each other and the presence of God was there. The glory of God was there. That's what made the Garden of Eden the Garden of Eden. Because if you don't have the presence of God, you can have all these things. But you don't have paradise. And the presence of the Lord would come as the voice of God walking in the cool of the day to have fellowship with man. What an awesome, awesome time it was before the fall. God's care for man. And then the third chapter. The devil leaps over the wall of the garden and he tempts Eve, Adam, and he sinned against God. Their disobedience created a sinner. Just like the archangel's disobedience created a devil. And what man had with God. Now, because of sin, a separation has taken place. In the third and the fourth chapter, as we begin to go from there, you're going to see what the results of disobedience to God, that small prohibition brought. It brought nothing but misery. And we'll see it. When you have God in your life, in the second chapter of Genesis, you have God's provision and God's care in, in just abundant ways. And all he does is come to you with one small pro prohibition. And the devil says, that's too hard. God's cruel. God's mean. God's unfair. No, God is good. And God took special care to provide all for all the needs of man. That's the kind of God I serve. That's the kind of God you serve. And that's what you can expect if you live for him in this life. And we will see as man begins to depart from God what that brings. We've got to know Him. He came back to restore everything that we had before the fall. Amen. And I'm so glad that I find it in, in Jesus. I find His care. Lord, we come before You right now. We thank You for Your abundant blessing in our life. Lord Jesus, today Lord, we pray that Your will would be done in each and every one of our lives, God, as we begin with You, as we continue with You, as You perfect us and restore everything that was lost in the garden back to us. Let us walk in this understanding. We thank You for the rest that You give us. We thank You for 
salvation, the water of refreshing. We thank you for the boundaries of your law to protect our joy. We thank you for all of your abundant provision for us, the blessings flung all over the ground and up in the trees. We thank you for providing companionship, relationship. We thank you mostly, God, for your awesome presence, your glory that rests upon us. Thank you for giving us a reason to live. Thank you for giving us things beautiful to appreciate. Thank you for giving us life. Thank you for giving us true wisdom that comes from you. And Lord, as we begin to walk through the chapters of Genesis to show the failure of man, the fall of man, let us understand what a life without you is like. We offer praise and thanksgiving to you for your word this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. You're dismissed in the name of the Lord Jesus. Thank you for coming. Hallelujah. Pray for me. I'm feeling after the Lord for the night's service. Before you leave, i got a question for you. How many believe that God has so much more for you than you've ever experienced? He does. That's the truth. You think, well, I'll just settle for it. No. If God's got more for you, believe Him for it and enter into that that God has already done because He's got great things for you and great things for me. God bless you. I love all of you. We'll see you tonight.